Good evening and thank you all for joining us tonight. I hope that everybody enjoyed their holiday and their new year because I know that I did. <laughs> My name is uh, Tanya Pintado. I'm one of the wound and ostomy care nurses here at the University of Miami. Uh, it is my pleasure to be your host for the first Awesome Support Group of the 2022 year. I'm truly excited about today's topic um, for tonight's presentation. It's about general nutrition for ostomies. Um, so it seems pretty fitting after the holidays that just passed and everything that we got to indulge in. Uh, this is an excellent topic to start off the new year, uh, but before I introduce our guest speaker, I want to mention uh, that during this session, you have the opportunity to submit your questions and comments in the Q&A box. It is located at the bottom of the Zoom screen, uh, and we will get to the answers at the end of the presentation. Um, now allow me to introduce our speaker for tonight. His name is Eitan uh, Stern. It all began in 2012, uh, where he graduated with a Bachelor's of Art in Economics uh, from Binghamton University uh, in New York. Following that, in 2016, he obtained a Bachelor's of Science in Nutrition and Dietetics from Montclair State University in New Jersey, where he graduated summa cum laude. He was nominated for the Montclair State Golden Key National Honor Society, which is extremely, extremely uh, impressive. That same year, he was a dietetic intern at Mississippi State University. And in 2017, he became a graduate assistant in nutrition for the Department of Health, Promotion and Wellness at Mississippi State. Jump forward to 2018, he was awarded the Mississippi State University Health Hero. Moving his way to warmer South Florida weather, he was hired as a registered dietitian with Morrison Healthcare in Fort Lauderdale. In 2019, he was awarded with the prestigious award of Registered Dietitian of the Year at Florida Medical Center, but he did not stop there. He continued his education and in August of 2020, during a worldwide pandemic, he obtained a Master's of Science in Nutrition from Mississippi State University and graduated with a 4.0 GPA. In 2021, he began at the University of Miami Hospital and Clinics Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology Digestive Health uh, Crohn's and Colitis Center and the rest is history. I really hope I didn't miss anything. So I'll let you take it from here, Anton. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, it's very nice to meet you all. Uh, again, my name is Eitan. Um, I think you covered everything, Tanya. So thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, the only thing I wanted to add is, so uh, the only reason I got into dietetics in the first place was I uh, was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and that explained the switch from economics to nutrition. Uh, and that's when I decided to go back to school because I was able to treat uh, or treat, help manage my condition using nutrition. So I wanted to come back and help people in similar situations. So I certainly understand the, uh, the challenges of having to kind of alter your diet for, for medical reasons. Um, so let me get started with this presentation. Okay, how do I share my screen? Share screen. Okay, excellent. So this is uh, nutrition for ostomies. Okay. Sorry, I wasn't patient. So what is an ostomy? Uh, and I kind of just want to go into the, uh, the basics of the col colostomy versus ileostomy. So an ostomy is an, uh, an operation to create an opening, a stoma, from an area inside the body uh, to the outside. Uh, the three types that we generally see are the colostomy, the ileostomy, and the urostomy. So um, first, I'm going to focus on the colostomy. So... Uh, the colon's primary function is to absorb water and sodium and to uh, excrete or get rid of potassium and bicarbonate. Uh, a colostomy is an artificial outlet for intestinal waste that's created surgically by bringing a portion of the colon through the abdominal wall, abdominal wall that results in a stoma. Uh, colostomies can be permanent or temporary, 
and they're generally used to help patients with intestinal cancers, diverticulitis, perforated bowels, uh, radiation enteritis, and uh, other types of obstructions. Um, output from a colostomy is generally more formed than from the ileostomy because the uh, contents has had uh, more time to go through the digestive tract. Um, there are a few different types of colostomies, so I just want to touch on this briefly. Uh, first, the temporary colostomy, which allows a, a lower, the lower portion of your colon to rest and heal. And then there are those permanent colostomies that involve uh, the loss of part of your colon, and it's most commonly the rectum. Um, there are, there's a sigmoid or the descending uh, colostomy, which is the most common type. And that is the end of the descending or sigmoid colon is brought to the surface of the abdomen. And it's usually located in the lower left side of your abdomen. The transverse colostomy uh, is when an opening is created in the transverse colon. And usually you'll find that in the upper abdomen or on the right side. There's also uh, your loop colostomy, which is again created in the transverse colon. Uh, and they generally have one stoma with two openings, one for stool discharge and one for mucus discharge. And then the ascending colostomy is relatively rare, but you'll usually find that on the right side of your abdomen. So uh, nutrition therapy for colostomies. You know, there are a few uh, objectives that we have when using uh, nutrition therapy with colostomy patients. The first is to avoid major problems like blockages, increased flatulence, and problems you know, with certain foods. We want to make sure that we speed the wound healing and recovery process. Uh, we also want to make sure we correct any weight loss or malnutrition, which can result from GI blood loss, anemia, protein malabsorption, or steatorrhea. We want to prevent watery or unscheduled bowel movements. Uh, we also want to make sure we correct or prevent dehydration and all the issues that come along with that. Uh, we, we try to individualize the diet as much as possible to make it work for you. And then obviously maybe to avoid infection. No. Right after surgery, the bowel is generally swollen and that's when we really want to avoid our high fiber foods. Fiber is the naturally occurring carbohydrate that your body lacks the enzymes to break down into uh, energy. So it goes through the digestive tract without being broken down and that can irritate a uh, already irritated bowel. Um, and by avoiding it, it allows the bowel to heal and we can also avoid blockages of the colostomy. Uh, the eating plan typically begins with clear liquids in the hospital, and then ideally patients are advanced to a fiber-restricted diet before leaving the hospital. Um, if patients have lactose intolerance or they know they're intolerant of lactose, the uh, naturally occurring milk sugar, we, gen we then generally recommend lactose-free milk products. Chewing your food slowly and well also helps reduce the risk of blockages in ostomies. Um, as you recover, you start to begin eating solid foods, uh, beginning with foods that are low in fiber. Uh, the fiber-restricted diet generally contains less than 13 grams of fiber for the whole day, and it can be less than 8 grams of fiber depending on your symptoms. Uh, if you do not have an ostomy, you know, the typical recommendation is 25 grams of fiber. That would be considered moderate consumption of fiber, and so clearly this is, this is less. Uh, most patients begin to eat, you know, a little more regularly after about six weeks after the surgery. Um, you know, I think these are some tips that I definitely want to want to hit on that are going to be useful. First, we want to make sure we take small bites of food and chew the chew our food thoroughly for better digestion and absorption of nutrients. The more the idea of pre pre digestion, making it easier for our GI tract to accomplish what it needs to, is very important and something I definitely focus on with my patients. Um, you know, certain foods can cause blockages, especially when they're eaten in large amounts or if they're not chewed well. And those foods I'm gonna list later on. Um, we wanna make sure we use caution when eating these types of foods. Eat small amounts only, and again, chew them thoroughly, which helps with better absorption of the nutrients. Uh, you know, you may find that your appetite isn't as good as before you had the colostomy. So it's gonna be important to eat small amounts of food every two to four hours, giving ourselves a consistent source of fuel and nutrition. 
Um, keeping a regular schedule for meals and for snacks can help to reduce the intestinal gas, and it can result again in the better absorption of the nutrients. Um, you know, we want, if we can, it's best to eat meals and snacks at the same time each day. Also, eating your largest meal of the day in the middle of the day can decrease the stool output at night, which makes it easy, which makes it easier for you to get a full night's rest. And that's going to be, you know, important as well. Avoiding foods that are acidic, spicy, fried, or greasy, as well as foods that are very high in uh, added or processed sugars uh, is going to be important because these foods can cause diarrhea. Um, certain foods can cause odors or, or, or increase gas production. To reduce gas production, we want to avoid chewing gum, drinking with straws, uh, drinking carbonated beverages, smoking or chewing tobacco, eating too fast, and skipping meals. All this causes uh, us to ingest air, and that can cause that, uh, that gas further down the GI tract. Um, missing meals can also cause a small intestine to be more active, and this can increase gas and watery stools. So that idea of eating something every two to four hours is going to be important. There's generally a lag time, uh, the time uh, from eating a gas producing food and the actual release of gas. Uh, and it's about six to eight hours for the distal colostomy patients. Um, we're going to try and limit foods that cause gas or odor and choose foods that may decrease odor. And again, I'll get to that later. Um, with colostomies, it's very important to stay hydrated. We, we recommend having at least eight to 10 cups of fluids per day. Um, and you'll need to drink more during hot weather when you have increased uh, output from your stools and at other times when you lose extra fluid, uh, such as when you exercise. Uh, for your knowledge, uh, one ounce of uh, fluids is about 30 milliliters, and one cup is eight ounces. It's important to watch for signs and symptoms of fluid or, or electrolyte imbalance, and these signs and symptoms include dry mouth, reduced urine output, dark concentrated urine, feelings of dizziness when you stand up, uh, significant fatigue and abdominal cramping. Uh, and if these occur, we want you to seek prompt treatment. However, ileostomy patients tend to be more at risk for dehydration based on where the stoma is placed in the GI tract. Uh, high potassium foods are also needed uh, to offset the effects of diarrhea. Um, as you get further and further from the uh, placement of the ostomy, it's gonna be important to add foods that contain fiber, but just to do it gradually, since they can cause blockages. So that just means we add them in very small portions and we chew the foods very well. Uh, it can help to keep a food journal uh, of the foods you've tried and how you feel after you're eating. We, we, I generally recommend only trying one food every three days. So we can really tell if this food is well tolerated or not. And uh, you also want to make sure that you're eating enough fiber and drinking enough fluids to avoid constipation. So some recommended foods uh, within the colostomy umbrella. First uh, are milk and our milk products. The asterisk uh, signifies that it contains lactose. So milk and milk products that you can eat would be evaporated milk, skim low fat milk that's lactose free, or the one that contains lactose, powdered milk, buttermilk, soy milk, rice milk, almond milk, other milk alternatives, yogurt, kefir, Cheeses, uh, aged cheeses like cheddar, Swiss, Parmesan are lower in lactose content because they're mostly fat and protein. A low fat ice cream or sherbet would all be recommended. Um, if you're having uh, a lot of liquid uh, output, you know, you can try a lactose free milk or other lactose free products. Um, lactose is again the milk sugar that a lot of people are unable to digest properly or enzymatically break down and it can cause uh, diarrhea. And so that's um, something that you want to think about as you are incorporating that in your diet. Um, buttermilk, yogurt, kefir, 
can help to can help your body from producing bad odors. So if you struggle with bad odors, those foods can help. Uh, cheese can help to thicken stools, and it may be a good choice if you have diarrhea. Specifically, the aged cheeses because it's just protein and fat. There's no uh, carbohydrate component that might cause the, the liquid stools. Um, it's important to check the labels for the calcium content of your milk alternatives, and we want to make sure that. Um, on the bottom of the nutrition facts label where it lists the calcium that the serving meets at least 30% of your calcium needs. Um, the milk alternatives are also not high in protein. So it's important that when you choose those uh, non-dairy alternatives that you can consume a source of protein with your meals and your snacks. Um, our meats and our other protein foods, any meat or poultry that's prepared with added fat is going to be okay. Uh, smooth nut butters are going to be good, but we want to limit the serving size to two tablespoons or less. So it's not such a large portion. It is a good source of protein, but we have to avoid the, um, the not smooth butters because that can cause irritation and blockages. Um, fish, eggs, Lactose-free cottage cheese or other cheeses are also going to be good sources of protein. Dried beans and peas can cause gas and bad odors, and those should generally be avoided. Um, for some people, fish, seafood, and eggs can cause these bad odors. And so what I'd like you to do is to try them in small amounts and see how your body reacts. Um, seafood, especially mollusks, Mollusks, things like oysters, clams, mussels, may cause a blockage behind the stoma. And so you have to make sure you chew those very well. And we want to avoid eating meats with casings like sausage or bratwurst because our body might not digest it correctly in time uh, to prevent the stoma from getting blocked. Um, peanut butter. Sorry. Peanut butter can help to thicken stools as well. Smooth peanut butter may be a good choice if uh, you have diarrhea, but again, don't eat those chunky uh, spreads. Okay. okay, our grains. Uh, things like breads, bagels, rolls, crackers, pasta, cereal are all going to be fine as long as they're made from a refined flour uh, or your white rice. These refined grains are good because they're removing the outer shell of the grain when they're, um, when they're producing it, when they're uh, manufacturing it, uh, once they uh, pick it up from the ground, they take out that outer shell that gives whole grains that brown color, but that can cause issues in patients with colostomies. And so we do want to focus on our refined grains when we can. Um, the ones that are made from white flour, white rice, a good way to know that uh, a grain would be well tolerated in a colostomy patient is if the label on the packaging says that there's less than two grams of fiber per serving. That's considered low fiber. Um, white rice and pastas can help to thicken stools and they may be good choices when you have diarrhea. Um, as you recover, you can certainly try whole grains, but again, we wanna try with very small amounts and chew them very well and try and keep a food journal and see how we feel after we eat them. Um, our vegetables. Um, most well-cooked vegetables without seeds or skins are going to be tolerated pretty well. Uh, you can do iceberg lettuce, uh, less than a cup, but we wanna begin with only a small amount that's shredded uh, pretty finely. And you can put it on like a white bread sandwich and increase the amount gradually week by week to see how you do with it. Strained vegetable juices and potatoes without skins are all also good options from that vegetable category. Now, some vegetables are more likely than others to cause gas, odors, and diarrhea. And I, I will get to those later in the presentation. Um, but many people do develop gas and odors when they eat onions, garlics, or leeks. Uh, vegetables in the cabbage family also tend to cause problems, things like uh, Besides the cabbage, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, uh, asparagus may cause bad odors. Uh, potatoes can usually help to thicken the stools and they may be a good choice if you have diarrhea. Okay, the fruits. Uh, most fruit juices are going to be okay as long as they don't have the pulp. Peeled fruit is gonna be important. That outer peel of most fruits has the insoluble fiber. And that is the fiber that we want to try and stay away from. So we want to make sure we peel our fruits. 
Uh, canned fruit tends to be good because it's very soft. And then fresh fruit without edible seeds are going to be okay. So I would stay away from things like raspberries and blackberries where they have those seeds that can cause irritation and blockages. Um, some juices can cause diarrhea, but diluting them with water can reduce the, the incidence of diarrhea. We generally want to only try one type of juice at a time and again, monitor for symptoms. Prune juice, grape juice, we want to avoid because they're more likely to cause diarrhea. Uh, talked about the fruit peels. Um, bananas and applesauce can help to thicken stools. And again, they may be good choices if you have diarrhea. Uh, our fats and our oils, um, butter, cream, cream cheese, margarine, mayonnaise, other types of liquid oils, those are all going to be okay. Uh, ideally, we're choosing healthy oils like canola oil and olive oil because they are heart healthy. We want to limit these to less than eight teaspoons per day, uh, as this can improve your food tolerance and symptoms of discomfort. Beverages, um, most are gonna be okay with the exception of alcoholic beverages, prune juice, and grape juice. Carbonated beverages, sodas, seltzers can cause gas. And if you're gonna try them, we wanna start with a small amount. Um, alcoholic drinks, especially beer can cause bad odors. Uh, cranberry juice is something that you, uh, can help your body from producing bad odors. So that's something you might wanna try, again, in small amounts, just to make sure that you're tolerating it. Um, we also want to avoid sugar substitutes, sugar alcohols, things like xylitol, sorbitol, mannitol. Uh, those sugar substitutes, those sugar alcohols tend to have an osmotic effect and draw water into the intestines. And that can increase output, can uh, loosen the stools, all those things. The ileostomy. So an ileostomy is, a, again, a surgical procedure that brings the ileum through the abdominal wall, so further up the GI tract from the colon. It can, again, be temporary or permanent. Uh, it can cause a decrease in fat, bile acid, and vitamin B12 absorption, and it can also lead to greater losses of sodium and potassium. Uh, most patients with ileostomies are incontinent of gas and stool. And a lot of times ileostomies are used to help treat or manage ulcerative diseases, Crohn's disease, and colon cancers. Ileostomy nutrition therapy. Okay. So the objectives with ileostomy nutrition therapy are pretty similar to the colostomy. Uh, first, we wanna modify the diet to counteract any malabsorption of nutrients due to diarrhea or protein or fluid losses. We want to correct any anemias that are caused by inadequate intake or blood loss. We want to make sure we stop muscle cramping and weaknesses uh, due to potassium losses. We want to make sure that we replenish calcium losses caused by steatorrhea uh, and bone density loss if you're on any sort of steroid therapy. We also want to make sure we prevent gallstones, kidney stones, any bacterial overgrowth, and fatty acid malabsorption. Again, your appetite may not be as good as before surgery, so it's important to eat small amounts every two to four hours, and keeping a regular schedule of meals and snacks can help reduce the gas and result in better absorption of the nutrients. It's important to let your healthcare provider know if you see any whole foods or pills in your ostomy bag. Um, and it's also important not to use time-released enteric-coated medications or very large tablets, since these are not likely to be fully absorbed. Additionally, we want to avoid laxatives since they can cause dehydration. Uh, it's a good idea to plan to have your largest meal again in the middle of the day, and we don't want to eat large. We don't want to eat large amounts in the evening. Uh, this can help decrease stool output at night again, so you can limit how often you have to empty the ostomy bag. Um, when you begin to add more variety back into your diet and you've had the ileostomy for a little while, we wanna make sure we only add one new food every few days. If there are foods that bothered you before surgery, um, I would add back other foods first and then only eat a small portion size when you retry the foods that you know bothered you 
prior to the surgery. If a food doesn't do well, wait a few weeks and then you can retry it. Uh, keeping a log is going to be important so you can monitor how you're feeling when you do try these new foods and expand your diet. Um, to reduce gas, very similar to the colostomy therapy, we want to avoid chewing gum, drinking with straws or drinking carbonated beverages, smoking or chewing tobacco, eating too fast or skipping meals. Now, missing meals can, again, cause a small intestine to be more active and increase gas and watery stools. The lag time for uh, gas producing food to actual release of gas is two to four hours for ileostomy patients. And that's a little shorter than the colostomy patients. And that's basically because again, the ostomy is further up in the GI tract, less time from uh, when you eat the gas producing food to when the release of gas happens, because again, it's higher up in the GI tract. Um, we are very important for ileostomy patients to get enough fluids, aiming for at least eight to 10 cups of liquid per day. We want to make sure we drink liquids 30 minutes after meals or snacks to avoid flushing foods too quickly through our system, because that can prevent good absorption. Um, the average output for an ileostomy patient ranges anywhere from 500 to 1300 mill milliliters in a day. Uh, right after the surgery, though, and during uh, infection of the stomach or the intestines, also known as gastroenteritis, the output can be 1800 milliliters per day or higher. Uh, during times of higher output, you definitely want, or heavy sweating, you need to make sure you're drinking more fluids. Uh, you may need to actually measure how much you're drinking and your output from your ostomy when it is above that 13 to 1500 milliliter range. Uh, again, one ounce is equal to 30 milliliters, a cup is equal to eight ounces, and eight cups is either 64 ounces or two liters. Uh, again, very important to watch for signs and symptoms of fluid electrolyte imbalances. If symptoms occur, we want to make sure we seek treatment right away. This can be, uh, symptoms can be dry mouth, reduced urine output, uh, dark colored urine, feeling dizzy when you stand up, again, the fatigue and the abdominal cramping. Um, if you have a high output ostomy, you may need to use an oral rehydration solution to replace the fluids that you're losing. The World Health Organization has a solution in a powder form that you can buy called oral rehydration salts. There are also some sports drinks that can increase stoma output. So pedi pediatric electrolyte solutions such as Pedialyte can be recommended instead. A less expensive option is to make your own oral rehydration solution using one of the following recipes. You can mix two cups of Gatorade with two cups of water and add a half a teaspoon of salt. You can mix three cups of water with a cup of orange juice and then add a three quarter teaspoon of salt and a half teaspoon of baking soda. You can mix half a cup of grape juice or cranberry juice with three and a half cups of water and a half a teaspoon of salt. One cup of apple juice can be mixed with three cups of water and half a teaspoon of salt. And then lastly, uh, one other example is four and a quarter cups of water with a half teaspoon of table salt and six level teaspoons of sugar. All these oral rehydration solutions are important because they rehydrate you and they provide you with the electrolytes that are not being absorbed in an efficient matter, sodium, potassium, uh, chloride, and we need to make sure that our body has enough of these because they're very important for the functioning of many different organs in our body. So we need to make sure that we are adequately hydrated and then have uh, those, those uh, electrolytes replaced. The recommended foods for the ileostomies, there is some uh, overlap with the colostomies, but I still think it's important to highlight them. First are dairy products, you know, things like fat-free skim or low-fat milk, your milk alternatives like the soy milk or the almond milk, your yogurt, your cheese, your low-fat ice cream. You know, if, you're, if you don't feel good after drinking milk or these dairy products, again, try a lactose-free variety. Um, the cheddar and the Swiss, cheddar, Swiss, Parmesan, any of those harder cheeses, much lower in lactose. Now we talked about looking for the 30% calcium on the nutrition facts label when you do have a milk alternative or a non-dairy milk. Um, 
making sure that when you drink a non-dairy milk, you find a, a source of protein that to make sure you're not missing out on any protein during your meal. Um, soy milk can cause gas and bloating for some people. If it causes these symptoms, I would avoid it. Uh, your protein foods, again, your meat, your poultry, your fish. You know, we want to make sure all these foods are very tender, well cooked, and prepared without added fat. Um, fish, smooth nut butters, and eggs, especially scrambled eggs, are going to be easier to digest. When you're trying things like the nut butters, the fish, the eggs, start with a small amount to see how you tolerate them. Um, these foods can cause odors. Uh, when we're cooking these meats, these proteins, it's important to use a moist method, moist heating method. This means that we want to use water or broth to cook the meat uh, or poultry at a lower temperature. This results in the protein being softer. Uh, we want to cover the dish uh, when cooking it in the oven so the foods cook in their own juices. And we can also marinate meats or poultries with uh, an acidic ingredient such as vinegar, lemon juice, or wine and some oil, or by using chopped raw pineapple, which has natural enzymes again to soften the proteins. And we can, uh, you can pour off that marinade before you cook. Uh, grains, again, grains that are made from refined or white flour are gonna be key, white rice. Things that are also uh, gonna be well tolerated in ileostomy patients are cream of wheat or cream of rice, refined grits. Uh, and cereals made from refined grains without added fiber, such as rice checks or cornflakes. Um, again, we want to choose grain foods less than two grams of fiber per serving. Um, the grams of dietary fiber uh, in one serving are listed on the nutrition facts label. You'll find it under the total carbohydrates on your nutrition facts label, which is on any packaged food uh, that you'll find in the grocery store. Um, we want to make sure we're reading our labels if you have problems with the lactose, because uh, some uh, grain products, some more processed grain products do have lactose in them as a, uh, either for taste or as part of the preserving process. And so we do want to avoid those if you don't tolerate lactose well. Um, vegetables, again, are well-cooked vegetables without seeds or skins, things like green beans and carrots, the potato without the skin, the shredded lettuce on sandwiches, the strained vegetable juices are all going to be okay. Um, fruits, so our pulp-free fruit juices, with the exception of prune juice, ripe bananas, soft melons like watermelon or honeydew, peeled and cooked apples and canned fruits with the exception of uh, pineapple. But we wanna make sure we avoid uh, canned fruits that are canned in syrup. So if we can find them that are canned in their own fruit juice or in water, that's gonna be key because the syrup can make diarrhea worse. Uh, we wanna look for 100% fruit juices and you may need to dilute them or use them to make a oral rehydration solution to tolerate them better. Grapefruit and grapefruit juice uh, shouldn't be eaten when you're taking a statin type medication or Entecort, which is uh, the brand name for budena, uh, bude budesonide, excuse me. Um, our fats, again, any fats are gonna be okay. Olive oil, canola oil, those are good for our heart health. We wanna limit the fats and oils to less than eight teaspoons per day. Uh, fats can sometimes cause symptoms of discomfort or discomfort, discomfort, excuse me, when eating in larger amounts. Uh, spreads and butters do contain lactose. So if you're going to choose those items, we want to make sure, just make sure that you're not lack, uh, intolerant of the lactose component. For the beverages, water, decaf coffee or tea, non-carbonated beverages and rehydration beverages tend to be well tolerated, but the carbonated beverages can cause the gas. Um, foods that aren't recommended, we want to avoid acidic, spicy, fried, and greasy foods or foods that are high in sugar. We want to limit food and drinks that contain sugar substitutes. Uh, often diluted sugar containing drinks are tolerated better. Uh, you can cut fruit juice in half by adding an equal amount of water or more. Um, while you heal, we want to avoid any foods that ca cause you to have odor, gas, diarrhea, or an obstruction. And I'm about to get there. You should uh, not have any salad or raw vegetables, especially in that post-op period. Okay. 
um, specific foods and their effects on potential symptoms. So for both colostomy and ileostomy patients, these are some foods that can cause blockages. Unpeeled apples. So we want to make sure that we peel our apples before we eat them. Dried fruits, raisins, relishes and olives, bean sprouts, grapes, uh, the greens for the salad, raw cabbage, green peppers, seeds and nuts, uh, the casing on the sausage, mushrooms, spinach, celery, uh, whole nuts versus the nut butters, tough fibrous meats, for example, like a steak on a grill, coconut, peas, vegetable and fruit skins, coleslaw, pickles, whole grains, corn, pineapple, cucumbers, popcorn. These are the types of food, or these are the foods that can cause blockages. So we do want to uh, avoid them in the immediate post-op period. And then if we do try them, try them in very small amounts and take it very slowly with them and monitor how you're feeling. Foods that can cause gas or odors in our colostomy and ileostomy patients can be alcohol, apples, asparagus, bananas, beer, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, our, um, our cruciferous vegetables, carbonated beverages, some types of cheese, corn, cucumber, your dairy, or your lactose products, your dried beans and peas, eggs, your fattier foods, fish, grapes, green peppers, melons, onions, peanuts, prunes, radishes, turnips. You know, there are some, there's some overlap between these foods and, you know, the ones that cause blockages. And then there's also overlap with foods that might be well tolerated. So a lot of times this is uh, very individualized. You know, if you have eat a lot of any of these foods, cut back from them or completely eliminate these ones and then start to test your tolerance and see how your body reacts. Um, the foods that can discolor the stool, beets, asparagus, spinach, any foods that have like red food dye and broccoli can cause this uh, discoloration of the stool. So keep that in mind. And then foods that can help to relieve gas and odor are things like buttermilk, yogurt that has active cultures in it so that uh, healthy bacteria for our gut, cranberry juice, and parsley. Um, these foods can cause uh, diarrhea or looser or more frequent stools. Alcohol, including beer, apricots, and other stone fruits, which are the fruits that have that big pit in the middle. I think peaches or plums, avocados, Beans, baked, baked beans or legumes, bran, which is a very fibrous grain, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, your caffeinated drinks, especially your hot caffeinated drinks, chocolate, corn, fried meats, fish and poultry, uh, fruit that's fresh, canned or dried, uh, your certain fruit juices like apple, grape or orange, uh, gum, high fat foods, high sugar foods, licorice, milk and dairy products, nuts or seeds, peaches, peas, plums, prune juices or prunes, your raw vegetables, your spicy foods, certain soups, sugar-free substitutes or foods that contain uh, your sugar alcohols, tomatoes, uh, green leafy vegetables, wine, and then your wheat and whole grains can cause diarrhea. So this is something where, you know, avoiding this, especially in the immediate post-op period is important. And then if we're going to try these foods, trying them in very small amounts and uh, monitoring how our symptoms are doing. Uh, and then foods that can help thicken your stool applesauce, bananas, which sometimes matching the bananas up makes it uh, even better, white rice, cheese, marshmallows, saltines, tapioca, creamy peanut butter, the potatoes without the skin, pretzels, oatmeal, 
uh, as long as you're tolerating a little bit of fiber, pasta, uh, but the sauce may increase the symptoms. So plain pasta, white bread, barley, and then yogurt. All of these uh, foods can help to thicken stools if you find that the stools are too thin. And that is what I have for you today. Uh, do I have any questions? Uh, thank you so much uh, for all those dietary tips. I know that some of the more common questions besides can I shower and how do I change this appliance uh, is do I have to avoid any types of foods or do my diet does my diet change in any way do I have to drink more water so thank you for touching on everything you touched on from odor to blockages to uh, things that can loosen the stool to things that can thicken the stool so excellent job thank you so much um, we do have some questions we have some pretty good questions. Um, one of them is, uh, can, what can I do to help eliminate or lessen the odors? Um, they didn't specify what type of ostomy, whether it's ileostomy or colostomy, but um, what is something they can do to help lessen the odors? Get back to the odors. Do, do, do. That was the Okay, to help relieve the odors, these would be the, the, the foods that I would mention. If we're talking about like uh, uh, using a food to help with it as opposed to things that uh, cause it. So if you want to try a little bit of buttermilk, the yogurt with the active cultures, the cranberry juice or the parsley, that may help relieve the gas and the odor. In terms of um, foods that can cause the gas and the odor, the, these are the ones here, the, the alcohol, the apples, the uh, cruciferous vegetables, your cabbage, your broccoli, um, your asparagus, uh, dairy products, eggs. So if I were you, I would look at this list and I can send you that uh, after this presentation is over to everyone this. And um, if there's a food you eat a lot of, the first thing I would do is pull back from that, limit that more. If you don't think you eat a lot of any of these foods, I would scrap them all and focus on other foods. And then when you're feeling better that uh, with the gas, with the odor, I would go one by one with these foods. Again, trying one every couple of days and seeing how you're feeling. Um, generally, what I recommend is first day, starting with a very small portion and then every consecutive day increasing a little bit. And again, monitoring how you're feeling, writing down if it's causing gas or not, and then you can test your tolerance in that manner. You had mentioned also keeping a food diary, and I think that's a really good option um, for determining, you know, if there's certain foods that maybe they don't uh, process well or do increase odor. So uh, the diary is a, is a good idea as well. Oh, definitely. It's a, it's a very good, very good way to kind of get in tune with your body. And then when you write it down, it's not like there's like step cutting. You just, yeah, you right. have to do it. And then you, you'll, you'll notice a difference in your symptoms. And how yeah, you're it's feeling. a very helpful tool. Um, there has been instances where they'll come to the clinic and they bring their, their food diary. So it's very helpful even for, for us as clinicians. Oh, um, so how, how many alcohol or caffeine drinks <laughs> should I have after my ileostomy? So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that um, they want to know how much is too much or, or if they're able to drink caffeine or alcohol with the ileostomy. Um, so I'll start with the caffeine. The caffeine, uh, I think you can have, a, it depends because caffeine can cause symptoms. So mm -hmm. if you try a little bit of coffee, black, Nothing added because we want to see if the caffeine is well tolerated. Not and like Cuban Cuban coffee, but not in this instance. <laughs> um, so uh, a little try a little bit of the black coffee and see how your body responds. If you notice anything like the odors or uh, abdominal bloating or increased stools, then it's something where you know you have to avoid it. However, if it is um, if you tolerate it, okay increase it a little bit and see how you feel. I just don't think you want to overdo it. When it comes to the alcohol, I mean, generally, you know, men, two drinks a day, women, one drink a day. But with the, uh, with the ostomies, I would recommend trying to simplify it as much as possible. So the, you know, the beer is probably going to be tougher for patients to tolerate. 
things like um, like liquors, I would not try any liquor that has any sort of added sugar or flavoring because that's going to cause a whole host of issues and we, we don't want to do that. So if we're going to try, if we're going to drink alcohol, which I don't necessarily think that you should, but if we're going to do it, try a very little bit of a very plain alcohol and see how your body tolerates it. Um, the wine might get a little tricky because there is more like naturally occurring sugar in it. And so that might have an effect on, on your stools, on drawing, you know, when you have increased sugar that's in your stomach and your small intestine, it draws water into it. It's based on uh, the, uh, the osmotic effect. So I would, again, be very careful, do very little and, and see how you feel. Cause you know, we really want to set you up for success moving forward. And if we overdo it with alcohol, we can you know, suffer a lot of symptoms and that's not what we want. I agree. All right. So our last question, um, can having a colostomy affect my ability to eat and digest food? So it's a colostomy versus um, ileus. Okay. So um, the colo if specific to the colostomy, the colostomy uh, takes place in the, col uh, the colon of the large intestine. And that is mostly past where most of your nutrients are absorbed and that's in the small intestine. So with a colostomy, you are at less of a risk for these um, nutrient deficiencies because your small intestine is fully intact and has the ability to absorb what it needs. With a colostomy, you know, your colon does a very good job of absorbing fluids. And that's why when you have a colostomy, one of the reasons is uh, that you're not absorbing as much fluid as you would normally, and that can cause an issue with dehydration. And then the sodium and the potassium is also absorbed in your, in your colon. So uh, those would be the things that uh, may be affected, but not so much like your vit other vitamins or your uh, macronutrients like protein, fat, carbohydrates. With an ileostomy, it might get a little bit trickier because the small intestine is somewhat compromised. So um, a lot of times we just need to make sure that we're eating more to make sure that uh, what, what reaches the, uh, the villi or the little projections in your small intestine that do the absorption, whatever, whatever can reach it, you know, will reach it. And it's not like it's skipping past or anything like that. But yes, I mean, the long and short of it is digestion, digestion is affected. And that's why it's important to follow these recommendations um, moving forward. Okay. I know that I said uh, that was the last one, but we do have one good one. Okay. Uh, this is from an ostomy that has a colostomy and a urostomy. So they mm -hmm. have a dual ostomy. Um, they asked, you said no alcoholic beverages with sugar. Would that include mixed drinks like a pina colada and grasshopper mixed drink? Not sure what a grasshopper mixed drink is, but, if it, but <laughs> pina coladas, yeah, that would be the added sugar that we're talking about. When I'm talking like about trying an alcohol, either plain liquor, like a little bit in a cup and trying it or adding a little bit of ice to dilute it. Cause that way you're not adding any sugars or anything else that can cause, um, any issues with ostomy and then you can really tell if it's the alcohol or if it's you know something else that would be causing it but again you know trying to keep this in moderation as much as possible because we don't you know we don't want to overdo it with the alcohol yeah. intake i know that we had covered uh fecal diversions but at least with the urostomy my my concern with the pina colada would be the high sugar content that's in it uh, and you know that sugar can attribute to a uh, urinary tract infection. So just, I guess, being very mindful if you do happen to drink it, possibly uh, drinking a glass of water too, kind of flushing it out, but just be mindful that there is a lot of sugar in pina coladas that can attribute to uh, urinary tract infections as well. Okay, so as we bring this uh, meeting to an end, I would like to make an announcement. Uh, we have prepared for the upcoming meeting. Um, it's going to be a on January 18th at 6 p.m. It's for the Spanish Ostomy Support Group. So if you or anyone you know is interested in a, a Spanish Ostomy Support Group, uh, we will have Dr. Maria Rueda Lara, who is a medical director of psycho-oncology speaking on the emotional impact of the life of a patient with an ostomy.
Um, if you have any questions or want to be reminded of these meetings, please write your email on the chat room and we will add you um, to our list. You can also check our website, um, umiamihealth.org and click on the supports group tab. All the upcoming meetings will be posted there. Um, but I did want to thank you very much, Aton, um, for taking your time out and giving us so many great nutritional tips. Uh, I know that some of these were refreshers, so it was great to have um, all this information and thank you for taking the time out and uh, joining us today. Of course, thank you so much. It was, it was really nice to be a part of this meeting. So I look forward to it in the future. Yes, thank you. We'll definitely ha have you back. <laughs> All right, thank you so much and have a good evening, everybody. Uh, you too, bye.